Well, today I want to uh, I want us to hear a word of God as it refers to we, and uh, the sermon series is community in one, and the the community is the Corinthian community, and our community, and the one being in one is in Jesus, and uh, as we're going through uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians and. You know, I just want to bring up something that we all probably know, but it needs to be restated, and that is that we we are living in a time of really increased radical individualism. And if uh, if you're rather young, it may not be anything new to you. For some of us older people, uh, it's something that we've seen happening through the years. A few years ago, uh, Google released a database of five million books that had been published for the last 500 years. And what was important about that was that now you can Google the text of those books and find out how often certain words or concepts are used. 500 years, okay, and 5 million books. David Brooks, who is a columnist for the New York Times, uh, did just that. And he wrote a, an article earlier this year, and he said in the past 50 years, he says, individualistic words and phrases increasingly overshadowed communal words and phrases. He said, for instance, the following individualistic words have been used more frequently. Self, personalized, I come first, I can do it myself. And in contrast, the following communal words have been used less frequently. Words like community, share, band together, and common good. Well, that doesn't surprise us any, I don't think. Then he goes on and he says that what he sees is the decline also of morality and moral virtue. And he says certain words were especially hard hit. Words including uh, words associated with courage and gratitude. He said, but also the following words have dropped in usage. Modesty, uh, humbleness, discipline, honesty, patience, faith, wisdom, even evil. So those words are decreasing at the same time that these individualistic words are increasing. And he makes uh, you know some assumptions about that. He says, so the story I'd like to tell is this. Over the past half century, society has become more individualistic. And as it's become more individualistic, it's also become less morally aware because social and moral fabrics are inextricably linked. And what he's saying is our morality is decreasing because community is decreasing. Could have told him that. But I don't get paid to do that. I'm, you know, uh, my New York Times articles don't ever get printed for some reason. So the story I'd like to tell us is this. Over the past half century, he says, things have been changing. And I think we're living in the midst of that. We, we experience that. As a Christian pastor, I'm, I'm very aware of a, a growing sense of individualism uh, in the church and the rapid decline in the realization that to be a Christian, to, to follow Jesus Christ, means that I need to be a part of a body or community. I mean, that, that is just withering away so fast. And instead, what's, what's coming up is a real sense of um, consumerism when it comes to Christianity, of picking and choosing, of going here and there and getting what we need from this place or that place. Um, it's become more of an I issue, you know, me and Jesus, and less of a we issue. Now, people embrace radical individualism in terms of Christianity because we can do it. You know, there was a time not that long ago when if you wanted to hear the Word of God, you had to go to church because the Bible wasn't in our language. You had to go hear the priest to translate it from Latin into your language. That wasn't that awful long ago in the history of the world. But now, you know, if you've got a mouse and a computer or whatever, you can, you know, get anything you need. I mean, the, the tools available to us, the word that's available to us, really make it possible for us to be more and more individualistic. So living a life as a, a follower of Christ seems to be possible because it's, you know, lots of times it really is just Jesus and me. I mean, who needs a church? Uh, why, why would we have a church when who's in the churches are hypocrites and people that judge people. I'm not talking about you guys, I'm talking about the other churches. But hypocrites and people that judge people and they want your money all the time. 
So, so why be associated with that when I think I don't really have to? I can kind of do it on my own, you know? I can get, get fed vertically here and I don't really need anybody else. Now don't misunderstand me. Uh, don't think that I'm against the church or think that the church is not necessary. Uh, it's exactly the opposite. And, and I want to get us our, our attention by giving you an old quote. It's uh, uh, 500 years old, but it comes from Martin Luther. Martin Luther was one of the reformers of the Protestant Reformation. And he said this, he said, apart from the church, salvation is impossible. Well, we'd disagree with him, wouldn't we? Say, well, no, we don't need the church to get saved. It's just me and Jesus, right? I don't, I don't need the church for that. Uh, of course, he wasn't saying that the church provides salvation. God provides salvation. But because the saved one can't fulfill what it means to be a Christian, to serve and to teach and to learn, those are community kind of things, then membership becomes an indispensable mark, and that's been the teaching of the church since its conception. And it's just recently that we've come to the point to think that I don't really need to be a part of a body in order to be a Christian. Uh, so the preference of many is to go someplace and to get fed and receive and more emphasis on the person who's preaching or the person who's leading or teaching, you know, and less and less on being part of the community. Now, today I want us to think about we. Our text is uh, in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, and if you're following along, it's on page 871 there. And as we read, I ask you to do something we usually don't do when we read the Bible. Most of the time when we read the Bible, we go, what is it saying to me? Today, what I want you to do is to say is, what is it saying to us? This is different. I mean, it's not bad to say, what's it saying to me? Because that's how, you know, we receive. But, but today, here sitting in the church, let, let's ask, what does this say to us? Um, everywhere that the word you is in this third chapter of Corinthians, it's plural. So we might say y'all. You know, that's how we'd say you, plural. We'd say y'all. And uh, Paul didn't exactly say it that way, and the translators didn't do that. But it is plural. And so uh, that kind of changes the way that we read this. Uh, let's get going here. 1 Corinthians 3, first four verses. He says, Brothers and sisters, I couldn't talk to y'all <laughs> like spiritual people, but like unspiritual people, like babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink instead of solid food because you weren't up to it yet. Now, you're still not up to it because you're still unspiritual. When jealousy and fighting exist between you, aren't you unspiritual and living by human standards? When someone says, I belong to Paul, someone else says, I belong to Apollos, aren't you acting like people without the spirit? And, you know, I can kind of hear the Corinthians say back to, to Paul, say, you talking to us? Man, are you, are you talking to me? Are you talking to us here at Corinth? You know, is, is this who you're addressing? Between the two letters that Paul writes to the Corinthians, he uses the word arrogance 13 times. So we kind of get the feeling that maybe the Corinthian church is just a little heady. You know, they think they know a whole lot, a little bit arrogant. And Paul says that they're babies. Now, he doesn't say they're children. That would be a nice thing to say. Say your children, meaning he's kind of the leader, the father type figure, but instead he calls us babies. And... Uh, I mean, they're still not on solid food. He says they, you know, Corinthians still got their sippy cups is what they got. They're, they're kind of eating the, you know, the Gerber peas and sweet potatoes, if you ever tried that with your kids. Everybody does that one time, I think. Peas and sweet potatoes, that's what they're, they're eating, that mashed up stuff, and got their little sippy cups is what he tells them. Now, the reality is, is more likely the Corinthians have told him, you're not giving us anything solid. You're not giving us good, mature teaching, Paul, and you're, you're treating us like we're babies and that all we can get is just this milk because they had other teachers that, you know, really bring it all the time. And 
The other teachers weren't messing around with that stuff like the cross and, you know, all that stuff about Jesus. They're giving them some hard stuff like, you know, what about demons and what about spirits and how to walk in the spirit. And the Corinthians were going, we want some more stuff like that from you, Paul. We don't really need all this Jesus stuff. And Paul says, if you would have received what I fed you, you know, Christ crucified, then you would be mature, you would need this milk, but you would be ready for some real food. But you didn't. You thought you knew it all. You thought that, uh, you know, he says, first of all, you got to eat your peas and your sweet potatoes before you get table food, kids. Years later, Paul would, uh, when he's close to death, would write to his friend Timothy, and I thought of this scripture this week in relation to this, in relation to e even our culture, what's going on. 2 Timothy 4.3, he says to Timothy, he says, There will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will collect teachers who say what they want to hear because they are self-centered. Wow. Can you believe that's written almost 2,000 years ago? I mean, are we to that point now? We've always been there some, but I just thought that fits so much. I mean, we all want people to affirm who we are, don't we, and to hear the right things. And uh, t today you'll hear people tell you, well, it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you've got good intentions. If you've got a good heart, that's all that matters is you've got a good heart. And if you intend to do good, then that's all that God cares about. Boy, I think that fits this passage so well. I remember when I first started in the faith, and, and we had a man who was um, not my pastor, who was telling us all kinds of things about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. We'll get to that in about uh, seven more weeks. You'll get to the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. But he was teaching us all kinds of things about tongues, interpretations of tongues, and healings, and miracles, and all that wild stuff in Corinthians, you know. And we were going, wow, this is fantastic what he's teaching us. And I'd grown up in the church, and I'd heard all these stories about Jesus, and, and I hadn't heard all that stuff. And so I thought, well, you know, I've only been a Christian three or four months, but, well, I've just... I'm just so much more mature than these other Christians who don't talk about this stuff in the spirit, you know. And this man's teaching me all this really important, heavy stuff. And, you know, it's kind of strange that they never told me about that. Um, I asked him what I should be reading. I find this really humorous now. Um, you won't, but I find it humorous. Um, I asked him what I should be reading the Bible, and he said Ephesians. And so I got my Bible out, and I read Ephesians. I thought, man, there's nothing there. This is, this is why didn't he give me something? This is, this is really nothing here. And he, next time I saw him, he says, well, how are you doing your Bible study? How was Ephesians? I was, oh, man, it's deep. I got a lot out of that. You know, you got anything else like that to give me? Because, man, I, you know just really this spiritual leader now, you know, I've been a Christian for three or four months, and I'm just really just, you know, all these other people in the church, I'm in the secret stuff, you know, and uh, now you, you look at my Bible, and the book of Ephesians is so, the, the pages are so thin that I actually, between, you know, it's the only book in the Bible that's worn so thin, it, those pages may not make it the rest of my life. Because I've read Ephesians so much. Once I, I got the milk in me, see, once I got the real table food in me, then Ephesians really came to life. But I was just a baby. We all start off as babies. Nobody starts off as mature. Everybody starts off as babies. We all have to be spoon-fed. And Paul says, I know that you've not been eating your baby food, is what he tells them. Uh, the truth about Jesus Christ, you, you guys are fighting. You're believers. And I know you're not Really you know, understand who Jesus is, yes, because you're still fighting with each other. And if you have the Holy Spirit, if you're following the Spirit, then you wouldn't be doing that. You have the Spirit, but you're not living in the Spirit, and you're acting like people without the Spirit. And he says, that's how I want, I know that you've not been eating your, your peas and your sweet potatoes and drinking your milk is because you're fighting in the church. Paul goes on to tell us about this process. Uh, verse 5, after, after all, 
What is Apollos? What is Paul? Their servants who helped you to believe. Each one had a role given to them by the Lord. I planted, Apollos watered, God made it grow. And because of this, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but the only one who is anything is God who makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together, but each one will receive their own reward for their own labor. We are God's co-workers and you are God's field, God's building. Now remember that the you here is plural. Okay, he's talking to the church. He's not talking to individuals. He's not saying that they as individuals are God's field or they are God's building. The church, the community of believers, is the field and the building, he says. And Paul changes his metaphor from being about childhood nutrition to one being about planting and, and, and agriculture, about planting seeds. And he says, uh, you're fighting about who is better, Paul or Apollos or, or someone else but we're co-workers. We're both servants. He says it isn't about us. We're, we're co-workers. And, and from this Greek word that, that's translated as co-worker, we get the word synergy, which is really hot today in business circles and stuff. And he says this is synergy where we, we complement each other and we work together. And we're just, we just plant and water, but that's nothing. He says, because the only one who is anything is God who makes it grow. I love that line. The only one who is anything is God who makes it grow. Now he's talking about faith, and he's talking about how people come to believe. And his point is, I think we know, one that we need to remember, because it, it reaches beyond the church life. It reaches into our individual lives as well. The only one who is anything is God. And I, th I think this metaphor works pretty well about the seed. I mean, I think we get this, don't you? Everybody's planted a seed at some time, and we just kind of take it for granted. We take the seed, put it in the ground, it grows. We go, wow, that's neat. Look what I did. You stop and think about it for a while, and really, you think you did that? But when I think of seed, I think of the, the little whirligigs that fall off the maple trees in the springtime, you know, those neat little, yeah, and, and off, off, the, off the soft maples or the water maples, and they come down, and you can make little whistles out of them and whatever, and, and just think you look at that seed and you go, well, that's going to grow into be this huge tree someday. No, you don't see that in that. And it, it could lie there dormant on the ground for years and years and years and years and years, and somebody could come along just inadvertently and, and push it into the ground, and it starts growing. We, we don't go, well, I did that. No. You know, there's something here that's so miraculous that makes that happen, and that's Paul's whole point about how we come to faith. You know, Paul says that's what happens in the church. One person plants. And that planning, it, it, it could be your parent, it could be a Sunday school teacher, it could be a friend, who knows. And, and that, that, that seed that's planted in you might lie there for years and years and years. It might lie there for 40 years. And somebody else comes along at the right time, and maybe it's been getting watered, but when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it, and the Holy Spirit causes it to germinate and start to grow, that's when the miracle takes place. And Paul's saying, it wasn't the guy that planted it. It wasn't all those that watered it. It was God who made it grow. It's all about God. It's not about the preacher. I mean, he's just watering. That's just what I do every Sunday is I just water something somebody else has planted, hoping that God will cause it to grow for some people, right? It's not the bands, not the worship leaders, not your small group leader. Everybody's just planting and watering. Nothing but servants. Really what he says here is he says, we are farmhands, is what he says. Apollos and I, we're farmhands. Now that's, that's not a real nice title to have, is, is being a farmhand. And, and they can plant and they can water for years, he said, but without God, nothing happens. And we say, well, you know, Don, that's not really very deep today. Um, we're, we're past that. Um, teach us something new. The thing about the seed, that's, that's not really much new. I mean, really, that's just milk is all that that is. We're, we're really ready for some meaty stuff. Could you tell us some things that, you know, are really deep about the Spirit? And, you know, what I would say to us is that, well, if we know it, then why, why are so many people in America running here and there looking for entertainment when it comes to God? And we really do. We, we go first for entertainment. 
if God is the only one that can do anything, then, then why would we ever have a meeting in Lexington and say, we're going to meet and have a campaign to change this city for God? You realize how arrogant that is to say we're going to change this city for God? If only God can do it, then the meeting ought to be about how, how, you know, who's going to water? How much, how much water can we get on these people? Because that's all that we're doing. And how many seeds can we plant? But we can't change anybody. I mean, if God is the only one that makes things happen, then who are we to write a book that says this book is going to change your life? Man, you look through the Christian books, bookshelves and all these books, this will change, change. They don't change anything. Books don't change anything. If we are at best just farm workers, farm hands, and if the only one who is anything than God, then why do we stand in line for autographs for Christians? I, I don't have, I don't know if anybody here has done that, but you see it all the time. You go to a concert, people will line up, sign my shirt, sign my CD. Wow, everybody's just a farm hand. Only God does it. How do people change? We really don't know how do people change. That's, that's how psychology got started, was trying to figure out how people change. And we still don't know. It's a deep mystery trying to understand why a person changes and what's in that seed that's coated there and turns it into a great tree. We, we can do all kinds of things to try to influence people and change people, but we can't do it. You really can't. Uh, we all learn that at some time when we're struggling with someone in our life that we love a lot and we're trying to change them. You just can't get it done. I mean, we can go out in the morning and, and uh, set all the radio stations to K-Love, you know. Uh, it'll, it'll take her three or four minutes to turn, turn the station. She's going to get something on the way to work, you know, and that won't do it, right? Or you can, uh, you can take all the magazines out of the, the rack there in the bathroom and all the sports magazines and, you know, put Christian magazines in and think, well, he's at least going to get 15 or 20 minutes. He's going to read something there, but, but that probably is not going to work either, right? Giving you some ideas, aren't I? Some of you working with somebody. Maybe I can get her to church on Easter. Oh, preacher, say something that'll change your life, right? Maybe this Easter, if I get him there, maybe, maybe it'll happen. And we can water and we can water and we can water and plant, plant, and plant. And yet it won't grow until God does it. In the end, it's all about him. It's not about us. Because the only one who is anything is God. God says, we're all working together here. Well, let's move on. Verse 10. I laid a foundation like a wise master builder according to God's grace that was given to me, but someone else is building on top of it. Each person needs to pay attention to the way they build on it. No one can lay any other foundation besides the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul said he planted the church. From his preaching, this church began. I was thinking about that this week. You know, he planted a church in the most pagan city in that area, and there were, were no Christians there. Now, we know how difficult it is to plant a church. Okay? Can you imagine planting in a city where there's no Christians? Nobody, nobody else, just you. You just start preaching. People start coming to the Lord. I can't imagine how difficult that would seem, but the... It was the Lord the whole time. And uh, Paul preached, Jesus Christ crucified. He said, that's the foundation. And uh, Paul said, there it is. Um, you know, from this um, phrase right here, we get the old hymn of the church. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. That's the foundation. I thought of Psalm 127.1, often quoted, says, Unless it's the Lord who builds the house, the builder's work is pointless. Unless it's the Lord who protects the city, the guard on duty is pointless. So money's not the foundation of the church. Members are not the foundation of the church. The building is not the foundation of the church. When we forget that the only one who is anything is God, we think we can build the church. And really, he's saying, that's just ridiculous. It's just, just silly. It's just not going to happen. Let's move on. Chapter, or verse 12. So, so whether someone builds on top of the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, grass, or hay, each one's work will be 
clearly shown. The day will make it clear because it will be revealed with fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work survives, they'll get a reward. But if anyone's work goes up in flames, they'll lose it. However, they themselves will be saved as if they had gone through a fire. Now, this is more difficult. Um, he says there are workers in the church, and some are going to build with some combustible materials. They're cheap materials. In other words, their teaching is not solid, and it, it's, it's not in keeping with the foundation. And he says when that day comes, which is the return of Jesus Christ, he uses the fire image. He says fire will reveal what's there, and fire will consume everything that is combustible. In other words, everything that's less than the teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, actually, most of the time, um, the churches that are founded on people and money and fleshly things burn up pretty quickly. They don't, they don't survive. And uh, there's all kinds of story about churches that we're going to start the biggest church in the world, and it doesn't last because there's no spiritual foundation in it. Today, the big discussion is all about millennials. Some of you guys are millennials. Um, I think it's age 18 through um, uh, 20, 29. We'll say 29, 30. Um, we might have to keep raising it for some of you so you can stay in the millennials. I don't know. But the whole thing is, why are millennials not coming to church? Why aren't they coming to church now? And the people that are writing this article are just not, they're not coming to their churches because the millennials are going to some churches. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. But why don't they come? And so other people are going, well, what do we need to change to get them to come? What do we need to say? What do they need to believe? Because we don't want to offend them. We want to be attractive to them. So we definitely don't want to talk about things that they don't want talked about. And, you know, there's this whole dialogue going on. You, you're probably not tuned into it. I don't know. But in church blogs and stuff, it's, it's heavy right now on how do we get the millennials. Well, same, same issue the Corinthians were having, you know. And some people are saying, well, we need to change things. So, you know, we need to talk less about this and more about that because that'll, that'll be attractive to them. And then they'll like us and they'll come and, and they'll like our church a whole lot. And then we'll have young people, have millennials and, and oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, you know. And, and the Corinthians are saying the same thing. Saying, Paul, couldn't you just play down this Jesus thing a little bit? This, this is just really a little overstated. This isn't really going too well in Corinth. And, and we're not attracting the kind of people that we want to attract. I, I thought about this passage as well, start the building, you know, I said, I've heard that story before, and I realized, yeah, the three little pigs, right? We've all known the three little pigs story, and how that whole thing turns out. It's not exactly the same thing, you know, but, uh, you know, they, they had straw and, and sticks, and that didn't go so well, and the, and the little pig with the, with the bricks, well, they all come live with him, and it's not exactly the same thing that Paul says here, but... Um, yeah, it's not going to last. I want to get to the next verse. Um, verse 16. He says, Don't you know that you are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you? If someone destroy, destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person because God's temple is holy, which is what you are. A lot of controversy over this, especially over verse 17. And I'm not going to explain that to you because... Nobody really knows exactly what's meant there, to tell you the truth. But I want to just bring out three things uh, for us here. Uh, remember that you here is plural. And so he's saying, y'all have the Holy Spirit. Y'all are God's temple. Okay? And he's speaking to the church. He's not speaking to individuals. And he tells us three things. And all three of these are really, really huge. First, he says that the Corinthian church... This recently pagan, arrogant, fighting group in Corinth, he says, is home to the Holy Spirit. He says some nasty things to them, but this is the reality. They're the home to the Holy Spirit. That's why I put this banner up today. We're going to leave this up for the rest of uh, our uh, Corinthian journey. We are a temple. That's what he's telling them. You're, you're a temple, you know. He doesn't mean that they individually have the Spirit, um, 
that they as a community have have the Holy Spirit and I don't know that may not seem like much to us um, but the reality is is that oftentimes in our culture we don't think as of the church as being a community that's inhabited by the Spirit together okay that the church in Corinth is a mess in so many ways and and we see the mess in the church uh, today and a lot of things that are bad in the church and and the church is God's temple here on earth the community of believers uh, has the Holy Spirit book was written I think about 10 years ago um, that sold a lot called uh, blue like jazz I don't know if some of you read it or not Donald Miller was the author and in it he told this uh, true story about how some people went to Reed College and they set up a confessional booth for people to come in and confess their sins and uh, people lined up to come in and when they got on the inside what they found was the person that was there to receive their confession first confessed to them and said I want to apologize in the name of the church for all that we've done against you for how deceptive we've been of how we've judged you and all these different things and it just blew people's mind Here's a representative of the church apologizing to this generation for what the church has done. And it was kind of strange because they had a different concept of the church after this, this person had done that. Changed the way some of them thought about it. But I think that for many of us, we need to hear, you know, really need to hear the word of God again that we who have trusted in Jesus Christ and who are bound together in a community of faith are in fact inhabited by the Holy Spirit. What we do represents God. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure we, we think about that much. I, I, I don't think we do. I think the gathering represents God. Um, usually we think, no, the gathering represents a group of people, uh, maybe a mission, but to think that we represent God. Second, uh, Paul gives a warning, and this is the hot place here in this, in verse 17. He says, if anybody destroys God's temple, uh, the church, here, he says God's going to destroy that person. What does that mean? Well, uh, we're not sure exactly what that means. And if somebody tells you, I know exactly what that means, don't listen to them, because I don't think they really know. Uh, this, this whole idea that if somebody does something wrong, that that is going to send them to hell is what some people say. That, that we really have some trouble with that. So if they do something right, that sends them to heaven. We know that's not correct. So what does he mean by destroy? We're not sure if it means eternal or if it just means you're going to have a rough life, you know. But what we do know is this. It can't be good. <laughs> we say God's going to destroy you when you destroy a church. You, you know, it's, you're not exactly sure where that goes, but we ought to take this seriously before we gossip about somebody or, or start a group that's against that group in the church, you know. And, and I, I think of, you know, some of the stories that I've heard of what goes on in some churches, and my gosh, uh, somebody needs to point this out to them, that uh, you're really treading on some rough turf here. And I think that this just gives weight to, to Paul's distaste for groups who um, do destructive things in churches. Then the third and last thing, as he says, you are God's temple. The church is holy, is who you are. Uh, he just declares the body, the community, to be holy. Now, that's what we should experience when we're together. Uh, holiness. Holiness. Hmm. We, we experience a lot of things together. I'm not sure that holiness is one thing that we think about much. But um, God declares it so. So do we feel holy today because we're together? We might feel accepted. Uh, we, we might feel, you know, understood. We, we might feel inspired. Do we feel holy when we're together in a church? God says we are. Our holiness as a church is not because... Each individual is holy. We are not holy because we do things right. We're holy because God says we are. God declares us to be holy as a church. We're holy because God's church and because he lives in the church. Remember when he said, we're two or more are gathered together, there I am in your midst. 
so glad he didn't say just one. I've often wondered why he didn't say 200, so we could get a quorum of 200 together, but no, he didn't say that. He says, we're two or more, we're gathered together. There I am in your midst. That makes us holy. I think about that. God has ordained that when we come together, something changes. He said, if two or more agree about anything, he says, it shall be done for you. Again, two, um, the smallest amount of community possible. Everything that we do, um, being a part of a holy body is probably one of the most important things and probably one of the most least appreciated, I think, of all the things that we do in life. Because, you know, so many things that we do in life are going to burn up. They're combustible. Uh, they're just going to evaporate someday. And yet, what we do in a body, if we're holy, is, is eternal. So, it lasts. Uh, I call us today to, to be aware, to be aware of what God intends and what God declares for the church. The church is not what America often uh, paints the church to be, but the church is a holy place. And I call us to accept that, to, to be a part of, of a holy body, uh, part of God's temple. And let's uh, have a, a prayer and let that soak in a little bit, and then we'll go to the table. As deep cries out. 